Hello, welcome to this video. My name's Will, and in this video, I'd like to give you a, a little bit of motivation about why we'd like to do computational thinking. What is so fun about programming? Now, I've called this Making Impossible Things, and the first thing that might spring to mind is all those wonderful computer games where we can run up the walls, swing on the sky, stop time, or do all sorts of other imagined possibilities in these universes within our, uh, within our games console or within our computer. But this is a science school, so I would like to start with a physical experiment that you can run. Now, it's going to be an experiment in diffusion, and the uh, instructions, or well, at least the equipment that you'll need is on the slide, but it's more fun talking to pictures. So let me show you my dreadful photographs of when I tried this uh, the other week. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to make some jelly. And so we're going to need some, I used some Petri dishes, but just some white dishes would do something, something white or clear so that you can see the color. Uh, so we'll need these Petri dishes. We'll need uh, trays or I used plates to carry them on. We'll need a jug to mix the jelly up in. We'll need some gelatin powder and a teaspoon measure for, for the gelatin powder. And we'll need some boiling water. And then, uh, well, about this much gelatin powder makes 500 mils of jelly, which uh, we'll use to fill the Petri dishes. And this is where I made my first mistake. Now, you see, I thought I could pour these jellies in my kitchen and I could then just carry them somewhere and leave them to set. Um, but I'm a slightly clumsy person. And so carrying a plate with three Petri dishes full of hot liquid jelly mix without spilling it, that's a little bit tricky for me. So I kind of mess it, made a mess of it the first time. But the second time I had the foresight to take the jug of jelly mix somewhere cool so I could pour it and leave it there to cool. OK, so now we're going to pour our jelly and we're going to leave it to set in those uh, Petri dishes. We head away, we let this set for a while, and then we're going to come back. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut out a little hole in the middle of each jelly. I used a straw for this, I think. And we're going to take some food colouring and we're going to drop some food colouring into the holes in the middle of the jelly. So now what we've got is these Petri dishes that are around the outside. They've got all of these molecules of set jelly. And then in the middle, there is this little cylindrical area where they have lots of molecules of food colouring. But there's no food colouring outside in the jelly yet, uh, except where I splashed a bit. And then we're going to go away and we're going to leave it for four hours. So I took, uh, I think, one of each of these and put them in various locations because I, I wanted to see uh, what the effect of temperature on the diffusion of the, uh, the dye through the jelly would be. So I put a couple of these in my fridge. That's a nice temperature controlled environment that I've got in my house. And then, well, what other temperature environments I've got in my house um, that aren't going to get in the way of everything? Uh, well, I put a couple in the garage because that's at least not refrigerated and the temperature is relatively stable. And I needed somewhere somewhere warm, but that they're not going to get, you know, uh, knocked over by uh, all the people in the house or anything like that or get in the way of people. So, well, let's just leave one of each outside as well, because that'll get a bit warmer during the day. And so we'll see things happening at a bit more of a temperature. So then we head away for four hours and we come back later. Sure enough, four hours later, these are the jellies from the fridge. And we can start to see that the food colouring has started to diffuse out through the jelly. And it looks like the red one's going more than the green one, which is interesting. All right, let's take a look at the ones in the garage. Yep, yep, sure enough. Uh, we've got the, the jelly mo uh, dye molecules that have left that little cut out in the middle, started to, started to move through the jelly. Uh, probably a little bit hard to measure how much in uh, this dreadful blurry photograph of mine. Let's take a look at the ones outside. And sure enough, there again, yep, we can definitely see some fringing here where we've got definitely green dye molecules heading out through the jelly. Same going on for the red one. Um, let, let's leave it for a day. Let's see if it'll diffuse further. And so the next day, this is the one in the fridge. Yep, yep, it's diffusing through that jelly. Uh, so is the one in the garage. And this is the one outside. OK, so what's going on here? Well, first of all, we better talk about what we think might be happening in diffusion. And so we started off with these little holes in the middle uh, that had all of these dye molecules. And around the outside in the jelly, we had all of the gelatin mo uh, jelly molecules. Um, but those molecules, they're not stationary. 
they're moving, they're wiggling about, and they'll you know, move more at higher temperatures. And so if we leave this, if they're moving randomly, then, well, after a very short space of time, they can't have travelled very far. But if we left it a bit longer, then some of them could have, you know, wiggled out a bit. And uh, if we leave it a bit longer again, then the, the longer we leave it, the further some of them could travel. But it's not going to be even because it's random movement. So they're not just heading straight out. Some molecules might be heading, randomly moving somewhat outwards. Some might be, you know, heading around here. Some might be heading out and kind of heading back. Uh, it, it's all quite random. And so we would expect to see uh, a smaller number reaching uh, the outer fringes of where they can reach and uh, quite a lot of them hanging around the middle and that's what seems to be going on. Uh, okay so that is my little experiment, physical experiment at home to start seeing seeing diffusion happening in my kitchen and in my garage and outside. But as I've been describing this I have been seeding a few problems that I hit doing this experiment physically. Well the first one of course was spilling the jelly because I'm slightly clumsy. Uh, but also this took time, you know, I had to set the jelly and I then had to wait a day for it to diffuse. Uh, and then we've got this factor that, well, actually, I've got to deal with the whole of physics, not just the bit that I want to look at. Um, so, you know, I, I said that I wanted to have a look at how this went uh, with temperature. But actually, the thing that I can see in these photographs is that the red one is diffusing further than the green one. And I think that might be because the red dye molecules are smaller than the green ones. And so the, the, the red ones can diffuse through the jelly molecules more easily than the bigger green dye molecules. Um, but it's also it's quite hard for me to measure how far they've got to measure that against temperature. And I didn't really have that much in the way of controlled different temperature environments in my house. I kind of need more stuff and it's a bit more awkward. Um, and then I also kind of hit the limitations of uh, this experiment if I was to do it at home. If I was to put these in my freezer as, a, as another controlled uh, temperature environment, well, the jelly would freeze, would crystallise, and th that change in the nature of the jelly might affect things. Uh, if I was to leave it outside on a hot day, the jelly would melt. And sure enough, a day after uh, this, we, we had a particularly hot day, and yep, the one outside, it just melted. And so the dye was everywhere because it was no longer diffusing through a jelly. It was in a liquid that could have convection and uh, all sorts of other things going on in it. So the, the, the liquid can just swirl about. OK, so if I do this experiment physically, I have to deal with the whole of physics because we're in a physical world and the whole of physics happens. Um, what if I wanted to explore just how a model of random movement might create diffusion? Now, this isn't the same as a physical experiment. In a physical experiment, we try things out, we experiment so we can say things about what happens. This is instead an exploration, a, a question of, well, if I modelled it like this, what could happen. Um, so it's not the same as a physical experiment, so we're not going to say I have proved that from it, uh, but it's going to let us explore, explore the effect. Um, so in a physical world, I can't really just take the bits of physics that I want, but if I write a little program, I can just put whatever effect I want into my model and I can see how my model behaves and I can see how those little theories I have of what's going on would play out in my model. So here is my much more abstract uh, model simulation of diffusion. And so you can see here is my jelly. And so instead of actually millions and millions of jelly molecules in, uh, in water, uh, what I've got instead is 1000 uh, light blue circles on the screen. And they're going to represent my, the molecules that are in the jelly. And this here, this is my little cutout in the middle where I have put my, uh, my molecules of, in this case, purple uh, food colouring, and there's 200 of them. So again, you know, al already we're, we're not quite being true to reality here. There, there, there's a lot more than 200 jelly molecules uh, in my jelly. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this totally simplified model of the behaviour of these. I'm just going to move them a certain distance in a random direction, depending on this number here, which I have called heat. It's not five degrees. It's just it's a number that's heat because it's trying to suggest the idea that, well, 
if we suppose that hotter molecules move further. And so this is going to be multiplied by some number, and I'm going to remove at every tick these, pixel, uh, these circles, a certain number of pixels in random directions. And then, after 500 ticks of my simulation, I am going to automatically count how many of them made it outside this measuring ring. So there we go. In my first trial, with a heat set at 5, 7 of them made it outside their measuring ring. I can go back and I can reset that and well, let's run that again. Let's see if it's uh, see if it's always seven. It's probably not always going to be seven, but it's probably going to be somewhere similar. I mean, this, this is random movement that we're uh, we're playing with here. Six this time. Okay, let's reset that. Let's turn the heat up to ten and let's play that. And we can see our diffusion happening a bit more before our eyes as the random movement of these particles lets more of them get out further over time. And so on this occasion, well, now we've had eighty-seven. Uh, made it outside uh, this measuring ring in that time and we plotted that point on the chart as well. Uh, now let's say turn this up to 20 and we can see buzzle 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 the diffusion happens in front of our eyes and this time how many are we going to get at 500 ticks? We have now got uh, 157. All right let's turn this all the way up now to 30. And let's see how many make it outside the ring. And uh, so this is happening really fairly fast now. And uh, well, this time we got, uh, oops, sorry, I've not let that get to 500. <laughs> let's let the simulation play out to 500 ticks. And so this time we've got 179. So we can start to see the shape of this curve. Um, now let's just test it because this looks as though it goes up a bit and it flattens out. Let's turn this all the way down to one. Now, I reckon that if this is down at one and those molecules are not moving very far, that none of them are going to make it outside my measuring ring because they're just not going to have the time. And sure enough, at none we get zero. And we then see more of them go through after a certain point, but then it starts to flatten out. And so I think, you know, about 25 will get one about here. So let, let's see if that's the case. And so what's going on there? Well, these these molecules, they're, they're moving randomly, these particles. So uh, as well as being able to randomly move outside the ring, um, some of them can randomly move back in again. And over time, there's more of them getting outside the ring, so more of them can move back inside the ring. And so sure enough, oh, that time we got uh, a little bit of a dip there. And uh, so uh, we had 161 that time. Let's reset it and play it again. And let's see what comes up. And so the, the, the next time we run this simulation, um, there we go. And so this time, OK, that one was quite close to, the, to that bit on the curve. So 173 uh, that time outside the circle. So this isn't an experiment. I can't say I've proved something about physics. But what I've been able to do is I've been able to take some little effect that I'd like to explore in the world. And I've been able to put it into my little program and I've been able to just see how that plays out and play around with the idea. Um, now, let's head back in the more engaging computer gaming directions. So some years ago, we got asked to give a, a group of year one and two primary school students a university experience. And someone asked me, you know, can I give these children a, a university lecture so they can feel, you know, like they're in a university lecture and teach them com some computational thinking that way. And I thought what we would do we would, is we would create a sim that would uh, play around with physics and let them see some physics. And then I realized they've already all of them done that because they've already all of them played Angry Birds on tablets. And that is a physics simulation made fun. Um, so I thought, OK, well, let's start showing them how we can start playing with things and, you know, change things in the program and see how it behaves. And so what we came up with after a bit of a comedy act, to, you know, entertain them at the start, uh, was this little homegrown unspectacular uh, simulation that looks a little bit like Angry Birds. I got my son to draw the pictures. And so we thought, well, OK, let, let's run this little simulated experiment where what we're going to do, we're going to drop the Angry Bird onto the plank, fling that this way, and we're going to measure how high the pig travels and how far it travels. And so let's run that. OK, about that high. It landed about there. OK, OK, OK. Now what we're going to do, let double gravity this is something you can't do in the real world. You can't really double gravity. Let's try. If we doubled gravity, would that pig fly higher? Would it fly the say lower? Would it go further, etc.? Let's run it and find out. And it turns out, well, actually, it goes about the same height, but it lands a bit further away. 
And so you get them voting on these things. And, you know, what, what do they think will happen in the simulation? And it didn't take very long before they were asking for all sorts of um, crazy things. So, for instance, uh, one of them, the ones they asked for was, well, what happens if you set it to a million? And I was actually quite impressed with this because you set it to a million and you get this cheer from the crowd as if it's flying off into space. But of course, if you actually look at the program, that's not really what's happening. We set it to a million. All that happens is this thing goes outside the bounds. The screen goes grey. It's in the top left corner. Nothing much is going on except the children whooping, going, yay, we sent the pig flying off into space. Um, then, OK, make it like the moon. Make it like the moon. Um, all right. All right. We can make it like the moon. Um, now, to explain that, the gravity on the moon it's only about a sixth of what it is on Earth. So let's change that number there from 10 to, well, the sixth of 10 is about 1.6. OK, and let's reset that light, uh, reset that and take the markers off. And now we have made it like the moon and the pig is flying through space on the moon. So this is kind of one of these ways that you can start to, you know, make even quite trivial little things can become these worlds of, of, of play for your imagination as you get to uh, toy with things that never are. And of course, then that heads back into the, well, what if we did make uh, environments that we could run up the walls, swing on the ceiling? And of course, then our models and simulations can become game-like game -like and much more fun.